Mr. Crispin here once again. In today's video I'm going to be machining a valve bow into my locomotive. They look something like this and I'm going to be machining them in one op. Now as you may have gathered I had a little mishap, a mishap in fact of exactly one inch. So let me show you the details of that before I start. Now I had it in my head that this component was roughly an inch long. Did my drawing, double check the dimensions and yes it's 0.937 so I looked in my scrap box found a piece of material two and a half inches long and I thought aha I'll get both out of that put the front face on lovely finish turned the ODs nice and parallel came to put the groove in start position fine diameter fine but uh oh it doesn't look long enough so I came back to check my drawing and realized that this is actually 1.937 so I was out by exactly an inch. The root cause of this is I had it in my head that I thought it was roughly an inch long when in fact it's actually two inches long. Anyway, on with the job. Unlike the main power piston, these are actually finished at this stage. So all this is finished geometry, it's uh, finished diameters all over, um, no secondary work to be done. And um, I'm going to show you exactly how the build-up of this works in part 3. But basically, this component is aligned entirely by its outer diameter. The internal bore is actually in clearance. So as long as these faces are square to the diameter, it's all okay. Now I'm just going to get on with this and I'll explain as I go. I've got a piece of 1 inch cast iron sticking out 2 and a quarter inches from the chuck. With the clearance hole drilled and the spindle speed reduced, I'm coming back in to break the edge. And I'm going to break the edge with a 60 degree centre drill. And that will allow me to use a centre to steady the part for the rest of the machining operations. OD roughing is complete and I've left about 5 thou on these surfaces. I'm going to turn my attention now to this cutout and uh, I've got a round nose tool at the ready and in case you didn't see the video in which I ground it, I ground it such that it will form this radius and then as it feeds out or in it will leave a vertical face. So um, I'm going to rough it out, take some measurements and go from there. Now something that may not have been clear there is when working with spinning components I bring the corner of the notch in to touch the corner of the component at a slight angle. That stops this portion of the caliper scratching the finished face. Now I've just done a little explanation on roughing out using a round nose tool but I did so with the camera switched off. Not a method I would recommend. But what I discussed was the fact that even with a relatively small radius like this, chatter can still be a problem. So when plunging in, rather than just doing a radial plunge, I tend to do a bit of a zigzag. So I'll come down and then, to exaggerate, moving both the cross slide and the saddle at the same time, feed over to one side, and as soon as you get to the line, back in again. So it's a bit like a zigzag and it just helps stop the chatter developing. I've now taken this to where the diameter is approximately 2 thou oversize and I've got plenty left on these end faces. So I'm going to start cleaning up one end, measuring the width and then working back from there. And I'm going to continue this process until I have about a thou left on each side and I know how much I'm taking off the diameter, at which point I will do one pass probably from this end in, across and out. This should leave me one thou on that side face and uh, notice when I get to the bottom of the cup I don't dwell at all, retract the tool immediately and that helps reduce chatter. That has left me approximately one thou on this inside face so I'm going to move on and work on the next face. Uh, something to mention though, the longitudinal positions of these faces 
need to be accurate because ultimately this has an effect on the valve setting. Now to do this by the book I should really be measuring all these positions from one face. If you noticed my datum was on this face so I should really be checking from here to here and then here to here and then here to here. That way all the measurements are taken from one face but I don't really have any measuring equipment um, that I can use on the lathe that will do all that. Instead I'm going to have to carefully measure from here to here then using slip gauges measure the internal gap then again use the micrometer to measure the final land. Now that may seem accurate but what you have to consider is the potential build up in errors. If my measurement here is a thou out compared to what it actually is in real life and if my measurement here is a thou out and again here a thou we're only talking errors there of one thou in each case but I end up overall with a measurement three thou different potentially to what I think I've got so uh, you can consider that an introduction to geometric tolerancing as it happens with the measuring tools I have present on this machine I'm just going to have to be careful and overcheck the final thing on a surface table now I just said I don't have a method of measuring this on the machine well actually I do I could use a depth mic hold a slip gauge on the internal face, depth mic again to a slip gauge held there, and then depth mic again to a slip gauge held there. Do a bit of adding up, and I could measure everything from one face. Is it accurate to use a depth mic holding a slip gauge against a small face? I'm not sure. I'm going to proceed with the micrometers and slip gauges as suggested, but just more things to think about. I'm now working on this uh, other face and just tickling it out to width. Well, with a couple more cuts to tickle it, I've now got it to where I'm just two thou under size. So this is one thou over, and the groove width is two thou under. So I'm going to feed in, take a thou off this side, take the diameter to finish size, and then feed out on this end and complete the width. The thing to watch here will be the corner engagements. As soon as I get to the finished diameter, I'm going to get a full quadrant engagement, and if it's going to chatter, it will do so then. I'm getting ready to make the longitudinal move before any chatter develops. And now feed along the length. And after it's just tickled that surface, that should be fine. I'm going to turn my attention now to finishing the ODs. I'm doing it again with a round nose tool to get a nice surface finish. And these diameters need to be accurate because it's got to match the piston valve liner. Using a tenth mic I have determined that I'm pretty much done turning. A tenth mic by the way is a normal micrometer that has a vernier scale around the barrel so uh, I can read here that I'm on um, 8 and then read around the scale 2 tenths um, and I can also determine that I've got a slight error in parallelism. I'm, I've got about a 3 tenths smaller diameter at this end than this end. Now to achieve the final finish and take that parallelism error out I'm just going to be using a lot of oil and a little stone. And this is done very gently and the important part is that you keep the stone moving. This middle finger is aligning the stone to the existing surface and then I'm using a rolling motion and just gently stoning the surface. The oil stops the stone clogging, which prevents the stone then scratching the surface. If not using my brother's toothbrush, then I like to use a bit of paper cloth in case it catches, it tears instead of getting dragged in. Now I'm talking about two tenths here, three tenths there. I need to make something very clear and that is that personally I wouldn't trust your average micrometer to give an absolute measurement to that kind of level of precision. 
I trust it to his inner thang, but to say something is three tenths oversized, I'd equally be saying it's not two tenths, it's not four tenths, it's three tenths oversized. And when you get down to that level of precision, there are a lot of factors involved and it would be dubious for me to say that this micrometer is giving an absolute measurement of that size without controlling all those factors. But I was just talking about tenths, so what was I doing? Well, I was using the micrometer as a comparator and I was saying that one end of the component compares to the other end of the component by a given amount. Not only that, I'm also comparing to the bore size. And how am I doing that? Well, I'm using the same micrometer to measure both ends of the component and the bore. Now to do this, you naturally have to measure the bore with something that you can get with your external micrometer. And the telescopic bore gauge um, is a perfectly good solution. Set the bore gauge and then you can measure with your micrometer and compare that number exactly to what you're getting on the lathe. Now by rights you could choose a more accurate instrument like this internal bore mic and that would give you a much better measurement for parallelism or an absolute number but to, to size the piston in to the bore you are then comparing the calibration of this instrument to the calibration of this instrument and unless you're in a really well controlled environment errors creep in. So for your average machine shop environment comparing the actual bore size to the actual measurements on the machine with the same micrometer is a good way to go. With that done it's on to the grooving work. With regards to grooving I have plotted out my positions calculated upon both the tool I'm going to be using and the size of the tool that I want to reference on the workpiece. So um, in other words I've done the drawing to suit the way I'm going to make it. I believe this is called design for manufacture. Now a few things I want to point out. First of all, the top slide is set at a bit of an angle and uh, that is to clear the front corner of the tailstock. No other reason than that. Equally, the tool post is set at a slight angle and that is so these faces in here clear the body of the uh, centre when the tool is wound right in and near the workpiece. And finally, with those angles set, you will notice that I have set the tool back at a bit of an angle relative to everything else to get it square to the workpiece and uh, I mentioned a bit about that in my video grinding around those tool. Now onto the grooving and how I'm actually going to do these positions and increments. Well on this machine I have a lead screw hand wheel and if I wind this you may be able to see the lead screw is turning. Okay and what happens is when I engage the carriage feed that now links the uh, saddle to the lead screw. So let me show you how I set that up in order to position my grooves. First of all I get the tool in the ballpark of the area I'm going to be working. I then engage the half nuts so that the lead screw has control of the saddle and I wind the lead screw until it's reading 1. Bearing in mind of course the direction of travel. Once the lead screw is reading 1 and everything's connected and the backlash is removed, I don't touch the saddle again. I use the top slide to position the tool one thou away from the datum face. And I'm doing this by touching on to a piece of one thou feeler and that's it. So the tool is now one thou away from the datum face and I'm reading one thou on my dial. Why use the feeler gauge? Just so I don't mark that uh, finished face. Now I mentioned I was going to finish this in one up, so uh, I'm going to let you into a secret. When I drilled this hole, I didn't drill it all the way through. I stopped one and three quarter inches in, which would be about here. And what that's going to allow me to do is to now take this um, special tool I've ground up, and I'm going to dig in the back here and machine this complete face and take it down to about 0.25 or 10 thou of a mil smaller than the drill diameter. And once I've finished this face and it all measures up okay, I'm then going to come back with the drill and drill all the way through. 
at which point I will be able to retract the drill and there will be a perfectly formed component resting on the end of the drill for me. All that I'll have to do is break the back edge of the hole and the component will be finished. Right, we're down to size. These, by the way, are calipers in case anyone's not familiar with them. Right. So now all I need to do is take this to width. Now just about any micrometer is going to struggle to get in here because the uh, centre body's in the way. So I'm going to remove the tailstock. Um, but there's one very important thing to say when it comes to installing and reinstalling tailstocks during an operation. And that is not to turn the centre and not to turn the chock. I will be cleaning the two before I re-engage them. But if you turn it, then any run out in any of these uh, systems ends up revealing itself. In case you were panicking earlier by the way, yes this stone is very uneven down the sides but the uh, actual main faces are really nice and flat. Just deburring anything that may have been brought up from those grooves. Now I don't really want big chamfers on these corners either. I'm just going to break the um, break the edges with a stone and again just try and keep the stone moving at all times. You'll see I am resisting the temptation to try and put the stone down that groove. I can guarantee even if there's a bit of clearance it will bite it and uh, not end well. So that is that. Now for my party trick I'm going to uh, party it off with the drill bit. Nice slow feed so that it has time to break through evenly. And there we have it, one finished bobbin. All that remains is a break edge on the back side and uh, finished in one up. So there's the bobbins done and I'm sure parting off with a drill bit is nothing new but the inspiration for that actually came to me from a story I'd heard as an apprentice. My colleague Tim Whiting, who is actually the uh, original owner of this overcoat, told me of a time in the late 70s when he was working in tree shop at Rolls Royce on large turning whereby a man had been operating a Ward 7 using a large diameter drill bit, drilling away when suddenly the chuck stopped spinning round. He retracted the carriage and the drill bit and to his surprise the whole chuck came off hanging on the end of the drill bit. Now I'm led to believe he had lost concentration while drilling and drilled all the way through the component, through the back of the chuck and into the machine spindle nose at which point he parted the chuck off and the whole lot became free. Now is that a true story or is it one of these stories that floats around factories? I don't know. Perhaps you could confirm Tim. Um, but it entertained me at the time anyway. Now I did so I'd machine the knots in this part but I've gone on far too long as it is so this will be continued. Apart from that I hope you've enjoyed watching and see you on the next video.